Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to talk about intramolecular versus intermolecular forces, and we're also going to talk about how both of those attractions affect us when we discuss a uh, changing state, going from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Um, so to start us off here, intramolecular forces is honestly more commonly referred to as bonding. Intra is referring to what's happening inside or within a compound. So think about all the things that that we talked about last unit ionic covalent network covalent metallic bonds all of those would be those intramolecular attractions however if that prefix changes to inter okay we have to be careful because inter is referring to what's going on the outside of the molecules what's going on between the ends of the different molecules themselves now back in pre p intermolecular forces we commonly refer to as imfs so you're probably going to be familiar with that little abbreviation there if i ever use that one um however you notice here that when i talked about imfs i mentioned here that this is between the ends of covalent molecules i didn't mention anything about ion or metallic and we're going to talk about why kind of as we go through some of these types here later um, now some of these types you're probably familiar with back from pre p we've got London dispersion forces dipole dipole forces and hydrogen bonding forces um, there's also some combination types that when we talk about solutions and mixtures that we'll get to like for example there is ion dipole forces um, we also have uh, in dipole induced dipole forces so we'll talk about some of those combination ones very soon however for now uh, we want to know that the bonds are on the inside of the molecule the intermolecular forces are on the outside of the molecules however what's interesting is that one affects the other so what's happening on the inside will impact how the attractions work on the outside so we have to be really careful with that however the bonds that are happening on the inside are much stronger than those imfs that are happening on the outside and to be honest the reason for that ties back to coulomb's law remember coulomb's law is force equals charge over distance um, if you're referring to the charge part of that equation uh, the partial charges that are responsible for imfs from those dipole moments it's like a partially positive partially negative um, those charges are much weaker than say a charge that's happening inside of a compound with either shared electrons or a full-blown ionic charge so that's one reason why IMFs are typically weaker um, but also the other reason has to do with the distance component the distance between different molecules are much greater than the distances between the atoms themselves the bonds have a much shorter distance than say the distance between one molecule and another and we can actually see that in our picture down here so this is zoomed in on a water molecule and as we can see on the water molecule, they have used a solid line to indicate those bonds. And when we use that solid bond line, that is an indication that that is a much more stronger attraction. When we get to our IMFs, you notice that we tend to use dashed lines or dotted lines, and that's to show that those attractions are a lot weaker. Um, but also on this, you can kind of see the distance difference. I know we've kind of zoomed in here, but think about the distance of that bond um, happening in between those atoms within that particular water molecule versus the distance between say this water molecule and this other water molecule so that distance is much greater here and as we know as distance increases attractive forces decrease and so that's another reason why those IMFs are much weaker than something that is a bond now here's the deal we have to be really careful with this whole idea of what kind of attractions we're breaking um, as we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas because it really impacts then what kind of melting points and boiling points that we're going to have are those melting points going to be high or are they going to be low so just kind of as a quick reminder of solids versus liquids versus gases and kind of why we're breaking attractions with those um, toward the end of the notes I put in there a table 
that looks something like this. It's just a comparison chart of solids, liquids, and gases. And honestly, the bulk of this chart should be a little bit of a refresher from pre-AP. So, you know, here's our typical solid, liquid versus gas picture. Um, it's also got all the kind of different traits down here of solids, liquids, and gases, referring to like solids having no fluidity, whereas gases are very fluid. Um, solids have a high density for their molecules. Gases have a low density for their molecules. Um, other things about compression and expansion and diffusion. By the way, if you don't remember diffusion, diffusion is when things mix. So solids mix so slow you don't even notice it, but then our liquids and gases can mix super easily. The one piece of this that I want to pay careful attention to is where we talk about attractions. The reason why solid molecules are so close is because there are attractions within a substance are really strong. However, you notice I just put attractions. I didn't specify if those were bonds or IMFs. And the reason why I didn't do that is because it actually depends on what substance you have. And you're like, what? We kind of lie to you back in pre-AP. In pre-AP, we kind of say, oh, well, these would have strong IMFs. Well, if it's covalent, that is true. But if it's ionic or metallic or network covalent, you're actually not breaking IMFs at that point. You're actually impacting bonds. So I did change all that to say attractions. Solids have very strong attractions. And as I heat it up and put energy in to start to weaken those attractions, I would change to a liquid. As I continue to heat it and continue to weaken those forces, eventually I would totally break any attractions I have and it would transition over to a gas. So the more energy it takes to make those transitions, the higher melting and boiling point values I'm going to get. So here's the deal. If my attractions are really strong, then it's going to take a lot of energy to make those transitions, and I'm going to have really high melting and boiling points. But if it doesn't take as much energy to make those transitions, then my melting and boiling points are going to be a lot lower. So to go back to the page where we were before, at the bottom here, I put a little chart that basically says, hey, what's holding a substance together as a solid? What kind of attractions would we have to break in order to go between a solid and a liquid and a gas? So here's the deal. If I have a network covalent where I'm actually breaking bonds, so notice here they used diamond as our example, or if I have a metallic bond, here they use beryllium, but think like copper or silver or all of our alloys like brass and steel and things like that. Or if I have an ionic compound, all of those substances, in order to melt or boil them, you are actually breaking bonds, which is crazy to think about. Now look at the melting and boiling points on those values. Look, they're like in the thousands here. Those high melting and boiling points are because I am trying to break attractions that are much stronger. When I get down here to these compounds, notice all of these compounds happen to be covalent compounds. And I have London dispersion forces, dipole, dipole, or hydrogen bonding forces. Notice how much lower my values are for melting and boiling points. Now we're only, you know, in the teens or the hundreds. Like those values are so incredibly low in comparison because now I'm only trying to break intermolecular forces, those weaker attractions. So I have to be very careful with my substances. By the way, one other comment about this whole idea of breaking bonds. Um, these still, even though I'm breaking bonds to transition it between a solid and a liquid and a gas, it would still not be considered a chemical change. It's still a physical change um, because I don't change the formula of the substance. So even though I am breaking bonds, the formula here is not going to change because I'm not rearranging it into new bonds. So kind of watch out for that one. Um, a common question that I've seen on the AP test in the past is something like this. When water boils, are bonds being broken? Why or why not? So here's where you would need to think about, well, for water, what am I breaking? Am I breaking a bond or am I breaking an IMF? Well, for water, it's covalent. 
and not a network covalent like diamond or graphite or glass, but rather just a regular covalent that has IMFs. Most of you remember from biology that water has um, hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces as its dominant type. So what happens there is that IMFs are broken, not bonds when it boils. So you gotta be careful about when bonds break versus when we are breaking IMFs. Um, so make sure that if you are ever asked a question where it says, hey, are we breaking a bond or are we breaking an IMF, that you identify what kind of substance do you have. Do you have one of those network covalent metallic or ionic compounds? If you do, then you are breaking a bond. If you don't, if you just have like a normal covalent substance, then you are breaking IMFs to make those changes. So so here in just a moment, you're going to watch another video for me. And that video, we're going to talk about these different types of IMFs and see which of these within that category are stronger versus weaker. Um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.